smart growth committee meeting to order. And this is at 601. Uh, with that, are there any comments, suggestions, petitions by residents in attendance regarding items not on the agenda? Sorry, I think I'm at the right place this time. Yeah. Uh, how are you guys doing tonight? My name is Ian Wybranski. Uh, we are here seeking a permit to replace and, re and repair our windows in our building. Been denied by HARB on multiple occasions um, and seek a variance to apply for the construction permit. Our building is located 119 North High. The proposed project that we are hoping to complete is to replace the double hung windows located at the front facade of the building and along Prescott Alley and two casement windows that are located on the face of Prescott Alley. We want to replace these windows because three reasons mitigate road noise, UV protection energy efficiency and well there's a fourth the windows are rotting as well uh, those four reasons render these offices on two sides of our building unusable uh, we've gone in front of harb several times and hope to reach an agreement of, to get parts or the whole project approved but time and time again they've made themselves unwilling to work with us and to meet our priorities buildings in towns such as turks Head garage chase bank building have set precedent that they're willing to work with some owners of the building, but not us, to replace their old windows. Um, we're proposing windows replacements to be custom made to match the existing windows in order to preserve our building's historic look. After countless pages, after reading countless pages of code of harm, explicitly says that contemporary design for altercations to existing properties shall not be discouraged when all, such alterations do not destroy historical design. This is exactly what we're proposing. When I read this section of codes of the board, they said they do not care. Um, if someone were to come out and take a look at our building, we take extreme pride in maintaining this historical facade. And you would be able to tell that it's very well kept. We make countless efforts to preserve our building's historic nature while doing the reno interior re renovation five years ago. This project will be no different. Thank you. When was that submitted to HARB? S September, I went, and October. And why are they denying your requests? Have they given you a reason? They said they'd rather us repair them rather than replace them, but it, they're, most of them are beyond repair. Building specifically is this? 119 North High. Did you have I, any photos you can? I do have a photo, yeah. So just a quick background on the process of how HARB works they make recommendations to borough council if the applicant does not agree with that recommendation they can come to borough council and ask for borough council to change that uh, recommendation that harb made if if harb denies it and borough council denies a certificate of appropriateness for a project it's a big long process. We have to send letters to the applicant, to the state historic and museum commission. So the reason that has, hasn't been on a council agenda because it hasn't been, it's been tabled I'm guessing a couple of times, the application. It's not the first time it's tabled in October. 
All right, I don't know about a denial, but okay, we can, I just don't know why a denial didn't come through and why it didn't come to Borough Council. So what we can do is if Borough Council wants to take the recommendation from Harb from the last time you were there and either change or stay with that, that's up to Borough Council, but that's how the process would work. Question, the statement was made that the uh, building or the uh, the shutters are beyond repair in your estimate and they wanted harb wanted them to re to be repaired and they wanted them to be replaced what what's the hang up with that i don't understand i, I mean I, I don't understand either oh, that that's to me is kind of confusing and obviously confusing to you gentlemen here that if it's underneath your knowledge that it needs to be replaced and they want it to be repaired, there needs to be some type of compromise or something to look at there. And I think the you suggesting replay, I'm not sure what the full scope is. Is it windows and shutters or windows only? Windows just shutter now. And then a later project will be the shutter. And you want and to do you, which windows? Just the double hung windows there. Uh, all five of those on the front? Six. Seven. Four on the second floor and three on the first floor. And the current windows oh, are. Sorry, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, uh, twelve pane, wooden shutters or windows. Can't really see it from the picture, but some of the window sills are really pretty ratty. So we're thinking we might trim those out with, uh, you know, with aluminum or some some material that will maintain the white structure, but. Eliminate some of the writing or something. See, that's. Windows themselves are supposed to be. So you are proposing a different material. It sounds like the problem, right? The, a different material. They're wooden sills now. Aluminum cladding. Oh, it is. Uh, wait, hold on, hold on. It's currently wood with aluminum cladding. It's currently wood. We're proposing wood with aluminum cladding. Yeah, I, so I see the the issue. So, and the shutters. You're pro proposing wooden shutters. Okay. So, and, and what I'm here, I mean, this is evolving a little bit. So Har Harb is pretty adamant that they don't want aluminum clad windows. They want to keep the historic for the, the wood windows. And I, now I just heard that they want to cap the wood sills with aluminum. And that's not something that I can see Harb wanting to approve either. So it feels like we're at a little bit of a disadvantage because we don't have the recommendations from HARB, right. which I think would be really beneficial, yeah. right, to really have this conversation. And can you clarify just one point before we proceed? So you can, so the mountain bars and the styles. It's that. Do you mind just speaking in the microphone? For you? There, there's people listening at home. Thank you. So if you look at a window, you have the, the surround. Those are all going to be wood. The only thing that's going to be the aluminum clad would be the window frame ex itself. Even the mutton bards, they're still going to remain wood. Um, so it's really not. That is a expensive repair or B is prime. So we're talking about just those areas. Because we're figuring that out with the same profile, the windows. We can't do that, and we'll find some other solution. But we're not talking about aluminum windows. I can see an iron hill. So again, I think you know if we could have the recommendations from Barb, it would help educate us on what the objections are um, and, you know, where there might be compromise. Uh, and and I, I'm a little confused, Mr. Gore. What I heard you say was it was declined in September and tabled in October. So if something is tabled, what does that mean? It's not a formal denial. They want the applicant to, applicant to come back to a future meeting so they can to revisit uh, and revise the plans based on the comments that they've made. Um, 
I think at this point, because we don't have those comments, I would like to get the minutes and put this on for next week. Invite them back next week. So all of councils here, we can review those recommendations and the minutes from the hard meeting. And then we can for make, the work session. Yeah. And make a more informed decision. Yeah, I would agree with that. And you're going to have to push the harp to get those minutes because they're, they usually come pretty late. <laughs> like if we wouldn't see them until next month. Trust so if we see them next week, that would be really great. Um, I had 1 other question. I think you said something about our goals or you started saying something about what we were looking to get out of it. No, I, I, what I was going to say was the, the process, as Mr. Gore said, was, you know, if it's declined, then you would come to council to see if you could get an exception. But this has it was denied initially and then tabled second the second time. So you haven't been denied. We just need to understand what they're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Well, did you make a revision from September to October submission? So originally we put the project in as one application. It included the arch window, the two windows beside the front door there, the double hungs, uh, the front door, or not the front door, the door that's in between the double hung windows there. Um, and they that's the one that they said you're not getting anywhere with. Um, then we broke it down into four double hung window, arch window. The two windows by the front door there and the, the single window or the single door there. Um, we're willing to just do the double hung windows for now. Yeah, this is the first I'm hearing of this and uh, I just I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding the whole. How the process played out that you went, you were denied, but you went back and then it was tabled. So that's a bit confusing. I, to I me. think what you just said is we tried to replace everything, all the glass in the entire building. Um, they denied that outright, especially the right side of the building where the Meridian name is because of the historical significance of that facade. Recognizing that, we then went back the next month with another application and said, leave that alone. We'll agree to leave that alone. Let's just look at the left side of the building and replace the double hungs only. And that's what was tabled. Does that make more sense? It does. It does. Thank you. And, and with that, with their recommendations that they made and you want to replace them, replace the windows, right? Send somebody out to see if they can be repaired. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Could, could they be replaced you based upon the HARB guidelines? Yeah. Yeah, they can. And that's what we're trying to do. Except for the thread, except if we use aluminum clad and not wood. On small parts of it, yes. Um, but what so they're replace? They're suggesting that we repair the windows. What we're trying to get out of the windows is not going to happen with just repairing these. Like they, I don't know if you saw, if you showed you the right picture, but these things are all rotted through. They're single pane glass. I mean. High Street, one of the busiest streets in town. So, you, our conference room is right there by the front, uh, the single black door and the double hung window. That that room is not usable because of the road noise. Um, they the first meeting they made a suggestion that we get storm windows. We already have those and it makes no difference. Um, in fact, I think they look a little bit uglier than normal windows, but personal preference. They were reluctant to even let me replace the windows. They want me to repair them and not replace, which again, it's not going to allow us to obtain our goals of replacing the windows. Yeah, I think as Mr. Corp suggested, once we have the, the minutes, you yeah. know, we'll be more better informed and be able to make a recommendation. Thank you for your time. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Uh, next week at uh, six thirty. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Six thirty. Next week, uh, Tuesday, six thirty. Uh, discussion items. Review draft EV ordinance. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Williams to.
give you a brief overview of the draft. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this has been in works for a while. <clears throat> uh, the, the purpose of EV ready ordinance is to make sure that uh, during new development, that infrastructure goes in a charge EV uh, EVs <clears throat> and that that infrastructure can be easily expanded in the future as EVs become more commonplace, which it is my belief, not uh, just as a environmentalist, but uh, I think for a lot of reasons, um, EVs are the future in our mind. Uh, that the the goals of the borough is that every car in the in the borough be electric by 2050. So we want to, if we're serious about those goals, we need to address this issue. Um, and the reason it's important to address during development is because it's between five and ten times more expensive to retrofit after the building is built. So um, we got a lot of development in the pipeline. It's something we want to get right up front, <clears throat> and uh, so. That's the purpose of the ordinance. Um, we basically took something that Phoenixville passed about a year and a half ago, format wise, and supplemented it with technical information from ICC's uh, draft ordinance, uh, their ordinance for this exact purpose. Um, Jeff, would you go to that uh, the one slide I sent you? <clears throat> Um, I thought it, it would also be important to start with a little bit of context, and I apologize in advance because we'll probably be repeat, repeating this next week, but you know how that goes. Um, in 2023, 10% of new vehicles sold are EVs. That's up from like a fraction of a percent five years ago, and it's really exponential growth. 25% of new luxury vehicles are electric. That tells me people who can afford them are more likely to buy them. Um, there's been some headlines recently about cost cutting. Uh, which is definitely necessary. They were, EVs are expensive because they've been able to sell them for the, the rate at the cost they have been. Um, cost cuts have been inevitable, and I think that's that's happening now. Um, EVs reduce fuel emissions about 80 to 100%, 80% if you're just buying from the grid, 100% if you're buying clean energy. Um, depending on uh, what kind of electricity rate, you're spending between $0.60 cents and $1 per gallon for fuel. It's the equivalent. Um, that's the reason EVs are going to take over that, and they're super, super fun to drive. Um, there's currently 40 models for sale in the U.S. with 124 anticipated by 2025. Um, I also thought it would be important as a little primer to talk about levels of EV charging. So that's on the top right. Uh, level one, that's an electrical demand similar to a toaster or a hair dryer. Plug it into a standard outlet that gets you two to five miles of range per hour. Um, I have an EV. I get um, about actually six or seven miles per hour off a 1400 watt thing that plugs into my wall. Um, so that can get me about 80 or 100 miles overnight. Um, level two, this is most common, that's 10 to 30 uh, miles per hour. So <clears throat> um, typical driver might need to plug in for three, four, five hours a week at that rate. Um, level three, those are DC direct current fast chargers. Uh, that's a very, uh, high, uh, electrical service. And, uh, this is the type of technology that you'll see at Wawa's, uh, rest stops on the highways popping up where, uh, you can, um, fuel up your car from zero to full in about half an hour. Or if you're on a road trip, say you're driving up to, um, Boston and your battery only gets you, uh, somewhere in Connecticut, you could stop for 10 minutes to charge up and get you the rest of the way to Boston. Um, so the gist of the ordinance, the ordinance is three or four pages, like all ordinance, there's like a page, which is, here's why we're doing this. Uh, there's a page, which is de definitions. And then there's like a few paragraphs that are really the, the, the meat of the ordinance. And this table <clears throat> summarizes what we're proposing here. Um, well, one other thing I'll say there's so EV ready. That means in the future, uh, EV charging can easily be installed because there's a conduit run from electrical panel to parking location and there's uh, available capacity on the electrical electric panel to install uh, up to level two charging. Uh, so that's EV ready, EV installed is all of that plus the actual plug installed during construction or, or redevelopment of a property. So with that in mind, what we're proposing in this ordinance is non-residential properties um, where charging is, people wanna charge at home. Um, you get home, plug your car in, you unplug it in the morning, it's it's full or you know you plug in for two or three hours and then unplug and 
let someone else in the apartment building plug in. You know, that's home charging is really important. Um, you know, the, the chargers outside the grocery store is, could be convenient at times to people, but that's not really the way you want to charge if you have an EV. Um, so non-residential properties, we're proposing 10% spaces be EV ready, but only 5% be installed. A multifamily, um, what we're shooting here for is uh, similar in terms of what's required during construction, uh, but setting the table for uh, a fourfold expansion of EV charging in the future. Uh, and again, doing that upfront means it will be much, much cheaper to install it once there's more EVs on the road and more demand for that charging in a multifamily setting. And then single family or uh, someone building a new garage, we're gonna ask that they make one spot EV ready, mostly just having that panel capacity in a residential setting, but we're not gonna require anyone to, to install a charger if they're building a new home or a garage in, in the borough. Um, so that, those are the limits proposed in the ordinance. I also thought it'd be helpful to look at this through the lens of a couple development projects we're all familiar with. Uh, these were obviously not, um, uh, not uh, subject to an ordinance that we haven't approved yet, but um, this is how it would look. And, and I apologize if I got any of this number of spaces wrong, those are always kind of moving targets, but at one point in time, these were the number of spaces proposed for these projects. Um, and uh, how many spaces would be EV ready? Again, uh, have the infrastructure in place to accommodate EV charging station in the future, as well as the number of spots where EV chargers would be installed during development. Um, so this is under discussion, but uh, in talking about it, preparing for tonight, there is actually a, an action item here, which would be, and I'm gonna try to get this right. Um, if this council recommends it to borough council next week, um, what well, we're actually, the, the action item would be to direct the solicitor, solicitor to prepare this. Um, in December, we could vote to schedule a hearing and then get this actually approved and on the books early uh, next year. We don't have full business meetings in January, but uh, probably a, a hearing in February. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. For the, the, the three um, developments you're talking about, have any of them Sort of voluntarily, do they propose to, to have any EV spaces? Yes. Um, yeah, we don't know how many, but um, I, I can say for certain that similar projects like Chestnut Square has EV charging installed. Um, I don't know how many. I, I reached out to them with that question and didn't get an answer. Thought about trying to sneak into the parking garage and uh, collect some data, but stop short of doing that. So that just looking at the one for a 330 market, um, you know, having 49 spaces capable of 240 volt charging, it's a pretty significant increase. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the percentages, is that based on sort of a national study or ASTO or has somebody proposed that or where does that come from? Um, we looked at a lot of ordinances um, started with Phoenixville. Um, there's a lot of ordinances that I feel like have been put together by folks that don't understand what they're advocating for, frankly, and that they've been overly aggressive in terms of what they're requiring. So I think as, as far as EV ready ordinances go to put those numbers in context, I think this is pretty modest and achievable. Uh, Phoenixville's ordinance requires uh, for parking garages or anything with a parking garage that 100% of spaces um, be EV ready. Um, that tells me they don't understand like the logistics of charging and how often you need to charge. You don't need one charger per vehicle. I think like one plug per four, six, eight vehicles is probably a good number. So I, I don't have a good answer to that question. It's sort of a synthesis of a lot of different ordinances and trying to find something that, um, nudges developers forward a little bit. But most importantly, future proofs the, the development and, and gets it done. You know, even what we're proposing here is, is a rounding error um, versus total development cost for 330 West Market, for example. Um, so I, I think we found a pretty good balance of being, uh, you know, pushing a little bit, but not um, making people do things that aren't going to be utilized in the future. Will this apply to parking garages, garages as, where as, uh, as well as lots? Yeah, and 
if there's, um, I think there's a, there's a line of mixed use divides spaces based on anticipated usage. So, um, if it was a parking garage, say there was a new mixed use development proposed, then the number of spaces, the ordinance applies to both, but the proportion of spaces would be different based on um, how those spaces are, are going to be used. I think that's in the zoning or SALDO, like you need X number of spaces per residential unit, right? have the applicant provide a parking study right. based on the use and that's how those the numbers derived. Yeah. And that would be for the existing garages like Chestnut High Street. No. That, that, that's what I mean. So <clears throat> how would that work with the existing garages and the existing borough spaces? Yeah. Would we be adding EV charging stations? So it's only gonna be on new residential and non residential. Yeah, this is for new development only. Um but yeah as a you know, separate initiative. We'd like to add a lot more charging capacity to the Wyeth property would be included. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm for this in, in theory. So I'm sorry to cut you off to answer your question. Those projects are, have already submitted land development. So they won't be subject to any changes in the zoning. I do know that 330 West market and the Wyeth have already, um, committed to installing, uh, charging stations there may not be compliant with this draft ordinance, but they wouldn't have to comply with this. Thank you. I, was, I mean, in theory, I'm, I'm all for it. I sort of feel like, you know, if, if Eli Khan or whoever is developing it wants people to live there, they're going to have to put them in regardless of whether it's in the ordinance or not. But I, I guess I'd like to see something that maybe incentivizes, you know, maybe there's some reduction, but they provide some public accessible charging like 330 market for instance if they could get some kind of reduction if they supply some on the street on market street sure i, I don't know something that is an incentive but also helps the borough overall have some yeah capacity for anyone to, to right. charge there yeah um and then regarding non-residential you know institutional I mean, it would be a big burden on, I suppose, a church, for instance, or some other not-for-profit to do that. And I, I think about the, you know, the use that they get. And just take a church as an example. I mean, mainly Sundays, are people really going to be charged in their car while they're at church? So, I mean, I think a little bit of leniency in terms of what the actual occupancy is might be. Uh, in order an interesting point, I'm going to use, um, <clears throat> Providence church as an example. <clears throat> they, um, they bought that building and renovated it, <clears throat> spent over $10 million doing so, but they leased that parking lot out to the county. So they don't, you know, they're not utilizing it only on Sundays or during services. So, and that could be. That could be a, a possible situation for other institutional uses when it's not being utilized, that's being leased out. I think maybe just being a little bit lenient towards towards them. I mean, take another example, you know, the Hickman. You know, um, if they've got uh I mean, I guess it depends on what level of care it is, but are they all you know, they're gonna have older individuals there that Maybe aren't likely to have an EV or yeah. even be driving. So and a lot of that'll be geared towards the staff utilizing those parking spaces. So I mean, we can we can look at it and see how, if what what could be worked in and what might be feasible. I, I mean, I, again, I'm I'm for it. I just would like to to know what some other places other than Phoenixville. Uh, are doing around the region or country. Yeah, West Goshen just passed theirs. Is is ours similar to theirs? Uh, I sent them a draft a few months ago and they changed a few numbers and passed it. <laughs> so I wrote it. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, there, there, there is one, one point I wanna um, bring to your attention and Jeff, if you can go to the draft for me, please. 
and scroll down, there's a yellow highlighted section. That's that paragraph right there. We can leave this in here, um, but that sentence will also need to be included in the zoning ordinance. And the reason for that is because it says all new single family dwellings and newly expanded or reconstructed garages. That would not fall under the subdivision and land development because it's only a single single home. So um, in order to get those to comply with this ordinance, we'll have to add it to the parking regulations in the zoning. So we would do an amendment to that and <clears throat> adopt those at the same time. Any uh, further questions? Any public comment? Uh, seeing that, uh, I believe we could take a vote to move this as an action item for the hearing on uh, December then, correct? No. <laughs> okay. So the, on the only action that you're taking is for us to work with the solicitor to finalize the draft and send it to, as, as written, obviously, but if you want, if there's any changes that you want to make, <clears throat> and that's why we brought it here tonight, because if there's any corrections that are amendments you want to make to the draft, let us know now because we have to send it to the county planning commission. Our planning commission has to review it. And every time we change it, we have to send it back to the planning commission. So that's why. So the, really the only thing you're authorizing us now is to finalize the draft and send it to the planning commission. I, I don't, I don't have any changes. Any. No, I don't have any changes. That would be just for clarity. It's a 3 0 recommendation for the. Voting session next week for the whole bar, the, for the whole council to vote on it to recommend the solicitor to. Okay. Yeah, uh, but, but as written with the percentages and everything. That's yeah, I mean, that, but you, you've, you've stated that you wanted us to look into. Um, the institutional projects. Yeah, and whether the percentages are. All right, I mean, I. I you said West Goshen changed a couple of numbers and, and approved it. To, did they change the numbers in terms of percentages? Yeah, up or down? <laughs> Way up? Yeah, that's really, that's one example of what I was referencing to the point about the added electrical capacity they were proposing. They were proposing level three for 25% spots. I mean, it's not really, it's like not technically feasible. Uh, that's what I mean about not understanding what they're proposing technically. So as the timing sits right now, <clears throat> because we don't really have a full agenda in January because it's a reorg, um, we wouldn't be having a public hearing on this until February. Okay. I mean, I, I think Mr. McCoy's questions are validated to look into. come back next month with, you know, a couple other examples or proposed, you know, what other folks are doing regarding non-residential. Next month or next week? Um, it could be next week too. Next week. That's fine. <laughs> next week. Yeah, we got, I think we can. I mean, on one hand, I sort of feel like, uh, you know, uh, asking developers to, to do this, that, you know, the borough needs to walk the, Walk the walk too. We don't, I mean, other than right here, the borough doesn't have any EV spaces, do we? Two out front. No, other than here. Uh, we have a few in the street. We have, have a couple, couple in the garages. Yeah, there's a couple. Both garages. I think how many are in there? Two in each? Two in each garage? So we'll call this a 3-0 for next week with the caveat that we address Correct. your comments. All right, we can move forward action item 4A, approve a motion to schedule a public hearing regarding short-term rental ordinance for December 20th, 2023. So you know how long we've been dealing with this and the back and forth that we've had, the numerous conversations, the ordinance that you have in front of you right now 
is the draft that we last discussed where this will allow short-term rentals to take place in the town center only with no residency requirement uh, and there's no parking requirement for those short-term rentals. Um, and that's, that's where we left it off. And this is the final draft that you see here. So we're requesting that we, uh, <clears throat> can hold a public hearing, uh, on December 20th to adopt this latest draft that you have. So Mr. Gore, is there a possibility because we have them, right? We've been having this discussions, how we got here. We have them. We're not having a problem with them. Is there a way to grandfather the existing, you know, short term rentals into the plan? I don't see how, because it's only allowing it in one zoning district. So with town center. As is defined, it could you define town center because I have a couple questions about. You know, what could be listed in town center as far as an Airbnb. Does it have to be. From my understanding, I believe town, the business district would include town center, correct? Town center as, as defined on the zoning map. The boundaries of town center. Okay. Now, with that, there would be uh, within the business district. And maybe it's just semantics. You can't have any apartments on the 1st floor. Would that be correct? Correct. Any new apartments or you can't, you cannot have any residential units on the ground floor of a building within the town center. Correct. So, with that being said, if someone wanted to have an Airbnb, they couldn't have 1 on the 1st floor. It would have to be on the 2nd floor or 3rd floor of their building. Unless they have an existing residential use on that ground floor, which they're. Maybe a handful of them, right? That are grandfathered. So what I'm what I'm getting at is, if you have that, and someone wants to have an Airbnb, and let's say if there's someone that, you know, uh, may have a physical disability, the only access they're going to have is the first floor. So therefore, I think we're going to lead ourselves into potentially. Litigation, maybe regarding that regarding existing units versus ones that could be potentially in the future. Because unless there's an elevator, how would someone with a physical disposition be able to get to the second or third floor? Because what I'm looking at is then we would have to completely amend. Well, we would probably have to redefine again town center then, if that's the case. No. Um, so, under the building code and the existing building code, unless you are changing the use of a property or you are making renovations to it, if somebody has an existing dwelling unit that they want to just lease out on a short term rental, they're not changing the use of that still a dwelling unit. So they wouldn't need to make any accessible upgrades to that under the requirements of the building code. Um, and I would, ha I would also say that there are probably probably 90% of the residential homes, if not more in the borough are not accessible either. They don't have ramps going up to them. A lot of them have steps. They have second floors. Many of them may not have a bedroom on the first floor. See my point though, with the Airbnb, you know, you have some that are okay, and then the others that wouldn't be wouldn't be able to use as a short term rental. And I don't think that would be that would be fair. What, when, when you mean when you say it's not fair, which ones? For people that would potentially want an Airbnb. To lease one or to own one? To, well, to lease or to own in that particular case. Based on accessibility? Yeah. How would I, that be different from a long term, though? Well, I mean. If it's the same unit that was a long term that wasn't accessible. Right. Well, I, I understand that. But, you know, say, for example, if you or I have a, a place in town and, 
if it's not grandfathered in and we want to have an Airbnb and you see the others have Airbnb, but we can't do it. I don't, my point is that I think that this could, if it just, if it's just listed in town center, that we could run into potential issues, I think. I don't, I mean, based on the requirements of the building code and what it says uh, you need to do for change of use or renovation, I don't see how, as long as you're not changing that residential dwelling unit. Now, if you were if you were taking all of your residential dwelling units upstairs and changing them to a restaurant or part of a bar, yeah, then you have to make access accessibility upgrades. But as long as the use does not change and they're not doing any renovations that would require building permits, they don't have to do any type of accessible upgrades. And I'm under, I, I mean, I believe that in my opinion, we should think about this a little bit more with the Airbnbs and I would love to see this table and I believe it should, we should table with a new council coming in. And I, I, I'd like to maybe ask my question a different way. How can we grandfather existing Airbnbs? I don't have an answer for that. And I would have to talk to the solicitor. I mean, <laughs> you have a lot of existing Airbnbs that are operating illegally illegally because they chose not to come to the borough and ask what the regulations were, chose not to do any due diligence, chose not to ask us what the borough regulations are and what the zoning code says. So they're operating without any type of approval. We're really here because we didn't really have an ordinance to mm. recognize the short term rentals as they exist today such as an Airbnb? Our current zoning regulations and the definitions that are contained within that zoning ordinance prohibit this type of use. And that's the position that we've held for years. And when people would call me to ask if they could operate a short-term rental or an Airbnb, we told them no, and we gave them the specific sections. Yeah, I, I, so how old is, this, is that ordinance? Kevin, and I'll just guess that it predates Airbnbs, which have only become predominant, I'll say in the last 10 years or less, right? That it's not something that was very popular. I'll even say five, five or six years ago. I think that, and again, you know, this has become relevant because an Airbnb owner came to us and is asking an exception. I think we need to look at it or have been looking at it more globally, right? <clears throat> so again, and I, you know, I've said this before, we've, we have them, we've had them. Granted, there's, they've been flying under the radar because we didn't really truly have an ordinance to address them specifically, which is what we're trying to do here. Um, and they have not proven to be a nuisance to the best of my knowledge, right? And I think I've been pretty clear about how I feel about this. So I I'm in I'm in total agreement, Ms. Dorsey. I think that, you know, I mean, we just had the previous discussion item about an EV ordinance to move forward with the future. And so I, I, I still think there's some questions. I don't know how you feel, Mr. McCoy, about this, but you know, I've gone back and forth between allowing them. I, I was okay having them in NC1 and NC2, but owner occupied. Um, so I'm still open to hearing, hearing more. I, I just, I guess my, my long-term concern is, you know, the lack of long-term rental properties that, that are available. Um, you know, I think. I sort of get the impression when Airbnb started, it was, you know, folks that are looking for extra income. They have extra room in their houses, but, you know, companies or folks that are buying 5, 10, 15 of these properties for that purpose. Um, we already have a housing problem. Thank you. Is there any public comment regarding this particular issue? Yes. Sir.
Hi, um, my name is Bernie Schaefer, and unwittingly, I started an Airbnb in the borough thinking I was allowed to. Uh, I apologize, Kevin, for not calling you, I guess. Um, and But I'm here to share my experience and my uh, thoughts about this. I would first encourage the, well, the, the uh, council has already signed off on Airbnbs in town center. So they recognize that they do provide a service to visitors. Um, beyond that, I would suggest that uh, this committee r recommend an amendment to the proposed ordinance and expand it to the rest of the borough, and I'll support that, and or delay the public hearing to next year so that more study can be made as to whether it's appropriate or not. I believe it's appropriate because there are plenty of people who benefit from um, the Airbnb market. Uh, obviously, and I'll start this by saying demand for short-term rentals grossly exceeds the supply in the borough. And a lot of these people who want uh, are visiting, especially Westchester people who keep parents visiting their kids or a parent bringing a kid in who's a senior in high school to visit and see if they want to attend Westchester, they can't get lodging in the borough by and large. Uh, Westchester has 13 or 14,000 undergraduates and three or 4,000 graduate students. And the demand from them alone is, is immense. Um, so I would advocate that you consider um, altering the proposed ordinance to include the rest of the borough and um, and or put off the public hearing for a couple months to study it more. Um, who, do, who benefits? Well, I um, was told by uh, somebody who's on another committee that uh, every shop owner and every restaurant tour in Westchester would, have, would want more short-term visitors. These people come in and they're coming in for a purpose and they wind up spending money. They go to, they shop, uh, virtually all of them shop and or go to, go to restaurants. Um, and who are these people? I'm gonna address what I think are some of the perceived negatives of this business. And I, I saw in the ordinance, it said these are transients, which I think is a pejorative name. I think that they are visitors and Westchester solicits visitors. If you go to the BID website and read what their job is, their job is to encourage visitors. You go to the, the, the borough website and they talk about visitors, come visit us, come, come and visit us, but we don't provide them with lodging. We don't, they're sent elsewhere. They go to other towns. So who are these visitors? Um, they're people you want to visit. They are business people. That's one of the big categories. Uh, relatives coming to visit uh, borough uh, residents for things like birthday parties. And these are actual uh, visits. Parents visiting students are a big one. Um, date night. Well, <laughs> what surprised us was the number of couples who come in even on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, and, but mostly weekends, and want to get out of Dodge. They want to get out of their house and they come to visit the borough because the borough has this great reputation. Um, tourists, people who tour Valley Forge Park, Longwood, or are attending an event at the Canal Theater are the types of people that come here. Um, our longest rental was about almost two months to a di displaced family. The, they started off in a hotel, but they quickly realized that like a lot of travelers, they didn't want to stay in a hotel. So they had a house fire and they needed a short-term rental. And we were able to provide it, I think it was for seven weeks while their, while their um, house was being repaired. Uh, we've had a couple people come in for employment opportunities, both at QVC and Chester County Hospital, and they needed um, uh, a short-term rental. They have the option if there's room available to stay at the Warner Hotel, yes, but the today's traveler is really sophisticated. They book their own trip on the net and then they decide what they want. A lot of people don't want, they want more than a hotel room. They want a place that resembles more like home. 
And I would invite you to visit what we've established and you would see what I mean. It's, it's much more like home. And um, today's traveler, a lot of them want Airbnbs. Um, to demonstrate the short supply, this is off of the website of um, Westchester University, and there's 30 recommended places where visitors can stay. Only one of them is borough specific, the Warner Hotel. They're sending uh, people to Coats Coatesville, Malvern, Exton, Chad's Ford, Great Valley, Kenneth Square, Downingtown, uh, Glen Mills, Wilmington, and Valley Forge, and I think I mentioned Great Valley. So these people are staying outside the borough, and this borough is keen on inviting visitors who are touring, and, 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 but we don't provide them with enough lodging. And even the uh, new hotel isn't going to satisfy all that demand. Uh, a lot of people want Airbnbs. They want the comfort of something like home. So who, who benefits? A lot of people. The shop owners benefit. The restaurants benefit. The service providers, somebody like me, who has a property owner and a big stake in the borough, I benefit if I run a good business. I'm, I'll make more money, um, just like the restaurants want to make and just like the shop owners want to make. Chester County benefits. There's a 5% lodging fee. Somehow, I presume, the borough can benefit through a fee and make this an income producer, too, or get part of Chester County's fee. I don't know, but the borough can benefit also. Uh, these people aren't disrupted. They don't come to neighborhoods disrupt. Um, I guess uh, I've only been operating maybe for a year, and I, before I did, I saw that there were other operations in town, so I made a mistake of thinking I had a rental license on my building, that I have a rental license and that there's Airbnb. So, but regardless, these people are rated five stars through the Airbnb system, or they don't get in. They, you're, you're not going to take somebody who's a troublemaker. Mr. Schaefer, if I may, for the sake of time, uh, for the sake of time, if, if I may, if you could just conclude with your comments and then we can, we can move forward with okay. our decision. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Couple other negatives. Um, inspections. Uh, I hear there's a, a concern that you have to inspect these things all the time. These, frankly, are the most inspected units in all of Westchester because when somebody goes out, the cleaning crew comes in and cleans it head to, head, head to toe and makes it perfect. Parking is no problem. Uh, the existing parker regulations and, and whatever uh, are adequate to support the Airbnb. Matter of fact, a short-term rental unit only uses about 250 spaces per year. If you had a couple in this apartment, one bedroom apartment with two cars, they need 730 spaces a year. So uh, the short-term rental market actually relieves the parking issue. And as far as residency, we have professional management that live right nearby. And um, I think the residency requirement is if you're not gonna put it into the town center, you, sh you shouldn't put it into uh, other areas. And I don't think it's required anyway. The owner of that building or that unit is going to make sure everything works. Um, and we've had no complaints. Great, so, thank you very much. Any other public comment? Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Well, well one, one question. Quick question. Yes. Um, so at some point you, your unit is, was all long-term. It was, yes. And you know, what made you decide to go from long-term to short-term? I thought I could make a more profit. Yeah. yeah. It's an investment. It's a very expensive investment, by the way. Uh, it's, it's not to be taken lightly. And, and, you know, we get rated every time a guy, somebody leaves, they write us up. And so things have to be perfect. Thank you. Or, or you're out of business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Stefano. Hi, thank you. Uh, Mike Stefano, Borough Council President. I just had a couple comments, and in the discussion I'm hearing, I feel like I'm, I'm missing, there's one thing that I think is not being discussed enough, and that is, that, you know, there's businesses, there's help to the, the economy of the borough, but there's also 
full-time residents that just live here full-time that possibly don't want somebody being transient right next to their house on a, on a regular basis. And I feel like there's also a lot of anecdotal stuff being thrown around and I could, I could give you a couple anecdotal, um, personal stories of, of using Airbnb's. Um, recently my wife used them a couple of times and I feel like there's, there's not enough checks and balances, um, in, in some of those instances where there are people owning an Airbnb, you have a bad experience and then they, they press you to give a good review so that you, they can keep getting people to come in and use short-term rentals. Um, and there is not enough check. The, the check is that they can give you a bad review and then you can't get a rental. So it doesn't, doesn't, it's not as easy as it seems. And I just feel like we need a little bit more information. That's not anecdotal. We should be talking to those local municipal, municipalities that already allow it and seeing how their experience is going. Uh, we right now may not be having the complaints that we, we, you know, that we are worried about, but and as of now, it's not, a, it's not legal to, to operate. So, uh, there probably are very few of them. If we allow it and it becomes rampant and people are coming in, buying up properties just to allow this, we might have problems that we don't see right now. Um, and unfortunately we can always come back on that. What's that clause? The Gailey clause. We can always come back on it, but the point we've already allowed it is our grandfather name in the town center. So I would just proceed with caution. Um, I think a little bit more time on this discussion and maybe getting some hard evidence and research from other municipalities would be warranted. So, thank you. I'm in agreement, and, and that's why I think oh, I would rather table this. Yeah, what table? And I just want to make I want to make two comments on two things that Mr. Schaefer said. Some two things that concern me. One is that he said travelers don't want to stay in a hotel; they want something that re more resembles their home. But we have two hotels in town. If people don't want to, well, we're going to have two hotels, and if people don't want to stay in a hotel. That's certainly going to affect the two properties that we have in the borough. The second thing is, he well, that would be supply and demand anyway. Uh, you know, well, typical not, economic supply and demand. Well, if, but if, if it was approved and then there's more Airbnbs or short term rentals, then that could hurt the. Uh, it, it could, but it would be based upon supply and demand depending upon where you want to stay. And then the, he brought up about inspections. I, I don't know where that was going about cleaning the cleaning people who come out and do inspections. I, I don't know if they know anything about building codes or life safety or fire safety. So these people aren't performing inspections of the property like we would. And, and that's another reason why I think table. My concern was before, if we're going to pass this, how or how and how many times are we going to be expect, you know, uh, inspecting these. Uh, Airbnbs as opposed to a long term rental. So I'm with Mr. Stefano. I, I feel that we should table this, learn more about it, learn more what other municipalities are doing. I agree. All right. All right. Thank you. Action item B. Um, these are the 2023 September HARB submission recommendations. Uh, 19 uh, South High Street, 236 West Market Street. Uh, I don't see yeah. anything. No, that was just for a roof replacement, and they just wanted the downspouts to be round aluminum, reddish brown color, pretty simplistic. Um, and to save the time on the second one for 236 West Market Street, it's a sign. The uh, HARP just approved three different options for colors of the sign and how they could be illuminated. And let the applicant choose which one they want to utilize. Any questions regarding items B? No. All right. We could call that three zero for one and two. Uh, approve the October 2023 smart growth minutes. Any objections? None. Any other business? Meeting adjourned at seven o'clock. Right on time with all.